Parent Perspective and Positive Advocacy Approaches with Andy Cooper, February 21st, 2024, Cirque's Wisdom Wednesday Webinar Series. Due to technical difficulties, we edited the embedded video out of this recording. Find the Kara Lawson Handle Hard Better video on YouTube or linked in this video description. Hi and welcome. I'm Allison Conch. I am the Program Manager of Special Education Resolution Center. And we are extremely grateful to have Andy Cooper here with us today. Um, she is a parent of a teenager with disabilities. Um, and she is also the Resource Coordinator for Tulsa County for Sooner Success. And she's going to talk to us about her perspective of raising a child with significant disabilities and interactions with uh, the school district. So Andy, thank you so much. We're excited to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Allison said, I am raising a 15 year old in the public school district and um, wanted to kind of share my perspective of um, how that's gone for us and things that we can do differently and better um, as parents, advocates, and educators. Um, we're going to start with a brief history of what Cannon was like when he was born um, and then how that shifted for him and for me. And we're going to talk about my perspective as a mom moving into the school system um, and raising a child I didn't know that I was going to be raising. And then we're going to talk about um, meeting teams, meeting mindsets and expectations with the schools. And then the best advice I've ever received the most honest advice I've ever received and how we're gonna build advocacy styles from that. And then again, the supports for educators and for parents. Um, so again, Kanan looks very different um, than he did at two in this top pictures. He had met every milestone. He was born healthy and typical, um, funny and loved the OSU Cowboys. And at three and a half, he started having thousands of seizures. And for me, at three and a half, you start to develop dreams and goals for your kids. And I thought Cannon was going to be raised on a football team or a basketball court. And we thought he was going to be under the Friday night lights, chasing girls and building forts with his cousins. And when these seizures started and everyone told us, this is probably childhood epilepsy, I thought, no big deal. He's still going to have a great full life. And that was not the case for Cannon. Um, at five years old, he was diagnosed with lennox gastaut syndrome, which is a rare form of epilepsy that causes cognitive regression. And um, because of this, we have taken an entire entirely different path. Um, we changed zip codes to be moved from a rural district to a big district so that we could get more support. Um, and we have been very successful in that. And what happened was we had to gain acceptance, not only for who Canon was and who we were going to be raising, but also we needed acceptance because Canon looks very typical and we needed buy-in from schools and educators to understand that cognitively he was around 18 months, but he still had his three point shot. Um, if you're mindful at all, you have probably gone to therapy and many therapists will say, how does that make you feel? I sat in therapy one time and I remember after Kenan was diagnosed and I cried the first two sessions and probably didn't say five words. Um, my feelings were hurt every day and I took everything that happened to him very personal. And as a parent raising a kid in the public school system, I can remember going through probably fifth grade and every first day of school, I would say, I'm gonna get this note. This year is gonna be the year he had a great day and a teacher is going to go well beyond my expectations. And through fifth grade, I was devastated every first day. 
because every year the backpack was empty and I never knew what his first day was like. And it took a lot within me to shift my perspective in knowing like that first day of school note really doesn't matter. It does not fix or shift his time in school. Eventually I did hear from the teacher and it was an email and I, I do hear from teachers quite often, but making my perspective known um, is, is a piece that parents often forget they have a role in playing. Um, parents have a great role to play as a voice for their loved one with significant needs. And I think sometimes we forget that because we often get our feelings hurt and are upset and we try to move in a different direction. And so mindfulness has really helped me creating a path for Canon. And this picture is just another example of early on um, a time that I was upset by school pictures and we just don't do school pictures now. Canon's health is what matters most to me. And this is something that hurt my feelings, but it does not impact who he is or who loves him or who he's supported by. He is greatly supported by districts and I have to keep those things in mind whenever I see little instances of things that are upsetting personally, but not as an educational standpoint. Um, caregivers, we wear a lot of hats um, today. Um, before Canaan was ready for school, I am it. I am who raises him. I have to get him fully ready. I have to get his meds ready. I dress him. And this, these two, um, pictures are from Dr. Tracy Salazar and she too has a child with Lennox Gastaut syndrome and tried to put this in writing to say, even between the seizures, we are still greatly impacted as caregivers. And what does that mean? And thinking about this as an educator, how do we know who our caregivers are? Because there's responsibility in that too. So between raising Canaan and getting him ready for school, I'm waiting on that next seizure. I constantly say that I live in a dictatorship because it's hard to keep a job with a kid like Cannon. Um, it is it is constantly changing and shifting plans and being ready for the next phone call. And um, that doesn't just go with seizure activity. That could be behavior. It could be a phone call from the school that there was an accident. And there could be so many other things unrelated to seizure activity that a school could call a parent at any time and say, hey, we've got this going on and we really need your support. And making sure that you have mutual buy-in, not only with the team, but also with the administration. Because sometimes the administration doesn't know your kid. Maybe, maybe you're in a district that has a thousand kids in the building and you're just one kid. I always say that Cannon is going to make his mark in any building and he is um, a lover of sorts and he wants to hug everybody and he wants to share with everybody and shoot hoops with everyone. And so you're going to eventually know him. But what about the kids that aren't that way? What leadership could we be exposing our teachers to to support these children better? I um, want to take a second and show you this quick video because many of our friends that have typical children, they go through first, second, third grade, and they just move through the school system and it's easy breezy and you get to meet everyone on meet the teacher night. Meet the teacher night is not really designed for me. Again, that's a mindset. I don't go to meet the teacher because I know I'm going to have a greater impact having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with his team. But I retell the same story to a new team every single year. 
And what does that mean for a new team? Because what do they hear? They hear, oh, this overbearing mom, she has a lot to tell us about her kid and he looks just like little Johnny from last year, right? As educators, we have these preconceived notions of who kids are that are coming to us or probably like Canaan, you may have heard about him prior to receiving him in your grade or in your classroom. And so I have to retell that story and I have to have a different conversation, but beyond that story, it's about trust. And if I don't have trust with a team, how do I gain confidence that he's cared for? And how do I know that he's taken care of and that people really understand what and how complicated this diagnosis is? And okay. even when the sound wasn't cooperating, I was reading part of the captions there. Um, it looks amazing. I, and, it, and it's, she's echoing exactly what you're saying there with you. The situation does not get easier, right? Um, right. He's sitting there advocate, letting them know that it's not going to get easier. You get better at handling it. Um, and each year you improve, um, and how you handle this difficult situation and difficult thing to navigate. Right. Right. Um, and, and that, and that really has been a huge shift in the way that I handle all of advocacy, not just for my son, but for all students. Um, these conversations are hard to have and they make us feel vulnerable. And it is a very difficult thing to do to walk in and hear about a child's deficits, to talk about a child's hardships and the things that they don't do well. Um, you know, and a lot of times we think about those things and educators are never really put in the position to walk a mile in a parent's shoe, but to think, gosh, what if I had the most vulnerable thing in my personal life as an educator and go in and share it with this new team every single year? You know, that is a tough, tough thing to do. And it's why we always, you know, every district I've ever been a part of, always encourages advocacy. They would love to have a parent that had an advocate at the table that's doing it well and appropriately because it is helpful to let the parent hear from other people and give different perspectives, not only from mediating from the school side, but also from the family side. Um, so we're gonna talk shifting into meeting teams and mindsets and expectations, what that looks like. This is actually a picture from a couple of weeks ago, Cannon just recently lost a classmate and um, a behavioral health coalition came in and brought art supplies to the most profound students. And everyone was amazed that Cannon wanted to participate because art is not necessarily always his forte. And so now I have that art project that he did. He did it all in orange for me and it's hanging in my office now. Um, and so it, so really having those expectations and thinking about who your kid is and how we can support them best. Family perspective is everything. We're gonna do a lot of work on this slide particularly because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, like I said, I've given, I've received great advice and I've received very honest advice and how we shift both of those and mold our style of advocacy, it will also mold the future for your child in a school district. So I know him as Coach Daryl Glover. Um, I grew up in Bristow and he was at one time my high school principal. And I remember in kindergarten, I did not know if I was going to survive what I was going through with Cannon. And it probably wasn't that big of a deal but to my heart, to my mom heart, it was. Because, you know, five years old, gosh, I think about that now and we were learning each other still, especially with this new diagnosis. And Coach Glover came to me and said, I called him and I said, I need you to tell me that this is gonna get better. And I need you to tell me what to do. And I wanted him to say the school's in the wrong, you know, because my feelings were hurt. 
And it's not at all what he told me. He said to me, there will always be conflict. There will be hard things that happen. But if you can stay in a positive lane with your school district, you will have the best outcomes for Canon. And I did not understand at the time what he was telling me because now I know many families jump school district to school district to school district, fight after fight after fight. But it is possible that their advocacy approach is not staying in that positive lane. And so when we think about that and that conflict that we think about, there are going to be hardships. Canon has not had an easy road through the school system. It has not been perfect, but how can we make it to where we're collaborating as a team? And I feel like a member of Canon's team at the school. There's a lot that matters in that. Um, and then, uh, you know, the honest advice I was given um, was from Sherilyn Walton. She's a great advocate here in Oklahoma or in Tulsa County. Um, and she once told me every educator wants and needs and loves a volunteer parent until that's a special needs parent. And that is something you're going to have to get used to. And I also did not understand that. <laughs> and it took me thinking outside the box to do that. And could I be volunteering in the coat closet to gain trust with administration? I don't have to volunteer necessarily for Canon's school or for Canon's classroom, but can I make my presence known in the district as a person and a professional that matters and that is gonna be a trusted person on a team that can show up for the district in a positive light? And that is what I've continued to do every year. I try to find a project within the district to help support. Hey, Andy, uh -huh. can I ask kind of a clarifier in terms of when Sherilyn was saying that to you? Uh, uh -huh. Was she meaning like they, they love it until it's a special needs parent because they're feeling like they're being watched or yeah. like you're there to check up on them? Is that kind of what she was? Yeah, and it, it's, it comes from a place of, I think, protecting the the privacy and dignity of other special ed students. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing to say as an educator, but really you can't be in a special needs classroom as a volunteer without a lot of confidentiality trainings and everyone has to be involved and know about that ahead of time. And Sherilyn really wanted me to understand that there are other ways to be really involved that don't necessarily feel as though you're trying to be intrusive in his education or that you're trying to play a gotcha moment um, or that you're checking up on educators because that's certainly not what we want to do. And if you were wanting to observe in a classroom, there are ways to do that professionally um, where it also wouldn't feel like a gotcha moment. Right, well, and I think it's so, what you're saying is so relevant because as a parent, what I hear is sometimes you're operating out of fear, right? That unknown right. and the school, people don't realize sometimes the school is operating out of fear. Like what is this parent's motivation? What are they wanting? And it becomes this thing um, that is, you're having to build that trust or rebuild it sometimes as to like what, you, what everyone's motivations are and that you're hopefully all there to work for the good of that student and uh, you know, in a partnership. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, whenever I think about what matters for Canon, this picture is in the school cafeteria. And again, he is in high school. And so it is a big place. And um, that trust matters to me because I want to know that Canon's team knows whether or not he's having a bad day and that he can handle the cafeteria. Does he look like he's going to have a seizure? Is his behavior just kind of off? Like we might be seeing some antecedents to behavior or seizure activity later down the road in the day. What matters to you as a parent? Think about those goals and make sure that you're setting relevant goals to, to your child. Um, for me, the cafeteria is in extremely important because Cannon's not going to be in high school forever. He's not going to be a student always. 
we want to make sure he's standing in lines, that he's working on saying his name to strangers because he is a kid that could be potentially in the community and have conflict where someone would ask, what is your name? Um, so we have really relevant goals around who he is and what he needs from an educational team. Um, who is on your team also really matters. I always want administration involved. Um, I think the utmost buy-in and collaboration can happen whenever you have your principal and your school nurse and anyone else in the building that probably is not day-to-day -day caring and educating your child, but who is going to be in the room to make decisions happen for Canon? It's going to be a lot of the people that aren't in there every single day and making sure that you find your village and work really closely with them within the school system. Um, how can I be a solution to a problem? Whenever Cannon was little and not in school yet, he was in daycare, um, what we did, um, we had a lot of seizure activity and a lot of families and a lot of children would come to us and say, why does he have the seizures? Why, what's wrong with him? And why does the 911 always get called and the ambulance and all the things? And when I'm thinking about a five-year-old asking those questions, how do you take the fear out of that? And so for many years in Cannon School District, um, when it was still appropriate, you know, I mean, nobody in high school wants to read a children's book now, but what I could be doing that is relevant for other families still, I wrote a book to address those fears of other children. And so the book is called Sometimes I Get the Wiggles, but beyond that, it's about going to school with a child like Canon, with differences like Canon. Instead of it making Canon a hero, we want to make sure that the peers around him know what is important and how to help support him. And so in that, we were doing disability simulations at schools to say, this is what it's like to have a speech delay. This is what it's like to have fine motor concerns or autism or a vision impairment and giving all peers that are associated in that, you know, typically we do it in grade levels, but associated with that child, making sure that they understand these are also students and classmates of yours. They just have differences. Um, and then when do I go all in? For me, it is about safety. The place I hang my hat and have really, really hard conversations with my district is when it's about safety. When I feel that Canon is compromised, if there is not enough staff, if there are safety concerns about getting him to and from the cafeteria, it's a great walk for him um, and making sure that he's adequately supported in that. And then again, the, the seizure piece for me is a huge thing that everyone in the room that serves him has to know about. Um, and those are the typical big, big conversations that I have. So know what matters to you as a parent, how you can be a solution or be involved and how to make those things better, not necessarily worse. And then going all in and really hanging your hat when it's important. Allison, Andy. did you have any? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I was just gonna ask, um, you know, from, from your perspective interacting with the schools, um, when you have had to have tough conversations or when you've had to think to yourself, like maybe this isn't a battle worth fighting or you know whatever words you might use, has there been anything at all that's been either unhelpful that the school has done where you're like this, you know, just, I'm just thinking in terms of any school districts listening or they might be watching this, yeah. unhelpful or helpful when you are, you know, advocating for his needs or in terms of, you know, picking what's important to you, has, has there anything that, anything that you feel like you would tell schools in regards to this? I think really, I mean, for schools, I would say really getting to know the caregiver and maybe asking them these things, what really matters to you? How do you want to be a solution to some of these problems? How do you think you could help support us? 
what could you be giving us more of? Maybe it's just information about um, a child's day. A lot of times whenever we are doing advocacy work for kids with autism, these kids go up and down all night. And then at school, they may just be flying off the rails and we don't know why. Could there be communication back and forth in a notebook? Or could there be a quick email to the teacher saying, hey, little Johnny was up all night. I may just keep him home. Or if you need me, call me. Letting educators also know that you're available there and ready to help support. And if that means coming home for the betterment of everybody, because if I haven't slept all night, I also don't want to be in school. Um, so yeah, I think just really getting to have that conversation, I'll say from my personal experience this year particular, um, the principal has actually come to me and said, how do you need me to show up for you? And ever since that conversation, we have had a different partnership and it has worked really, really well to know that I have his support with things like additional staff when it's required and that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and how are we supporting most vulnerable students? Again, communication. I don't think it can be done real successfully without the caregiver being involved. And so we think about um, many districts have a lot of families moving in that have, um, you know, dual language families or um, limited language skills. And, you know, a lot of times in low income areas, we face families that are um, not able to read at above an eighth grade level. And so are they getting the documents? Are they able to like receive what's being asked of them, whether or not it's help with homework and that kind of thing. And so um, again, really, really understanding who your caregiver is to the child that you're serving um, and communication going back and forth always can be a resolve um, for that if it's done appropriately. Um, and then peer support um, of all ages. I am, my background is birth to five. And so I always, in the littles, I always want to find the bossiest little girl in the classroom. And I want her to sit next to little Johnny and he's going to help, or she's going to help him do things like dish his plate for food, open milk. Maybe it's that they hold hands at circle time. Maybe do you want to dance with little Johnny today? Making sure that there's a peer that is also modeling some of the things that we want to see from our kids with more profound needs. Um, when you get into the older um, ages, like my son is 15. And one thing that I always say to administration is, don't count out the kids that are sitting in detention. Give them purpose and it will duly serve my son as well as the child in detention because it will give him purpose. It will give him something to look forward to. But my son also wants to really be connected to his peers, whether or not that's, you know, gym, maybe it's 30 minutes playing basketball. And that is a service time that a child, instead of, you know, they have a choice. Is it detention or basketball with Canon? Um, is it detention or reading a book with little Johnny in the classroom? And so making sure that we're using that peer support as a modeling tool, um, it can go a long, long way for, for families too, to know that kids are connected to typical peers. Um, and then asking before you assume things, that is, that is one thing, you know, going back to the school picture that I um, received, I went straight to the principal that year and I said, how would you feel, you know, how, you know, and she was like, Keenan was having a really bad day. And I just assumed it was this very segregated class picture and, um, you know, knowing all of what I know now, it's going in, asking the right questions instead of assuming on the front end and getting really, really upset and being kind of in that headspace where, you know, we call it your brainstem in early childhood and, you know, really being upset that, and, you know, what I've also learned to do over time is if I am upset, I sit on that. Maybe it's 24 hours. Maybe it's I check in with a friend or a mentor first. 
And I wanted to just, you know, slightly promote a book here. It's called Everyday Blessings and it's the inner work of mindful parenting. Um, it's John Cabot Zinn, and he does a lot of work around mindfulness, but this specific book is around parenting in general. It's not around special education parenting, but it is a great book in my professional world too, just because you have that um, mindfulness technique to think, how does a child feel? I think about this book a lot whenever I see families that are stuck on their phones in front of their children and their parent or their children are just begging for that attention. Um, but really look into this book. If you're an educator, there's a lot in here that can also help support you in classrooms with um, children with disabilities as well. Andy, uh -huh. I, I, I want to touch on a couple of the things you said. Yeah. I loved the part about the asking before you assuming, and I think that that can go for parents and schools is, you right. know, not making the assumption we think we know where people are coming from or what has occurred. Um, or if we're going to start with an assumption, start with the assumption that this person is not out to get us, right? Or this person right. is only caring about their, their child or um, start with the positive assumption and ask questions to better understand. I think that's huge. And it's a lot of what um, is discussed in some of the communication trainings that, that CERC does too, is, is really not jumping to those negative conclusions and operate out of this different mindset. Um, so I think that's such a big deal, but I know that it's hard um, sometimes for parents and for schools, if you're operating out of, you know, an emotional mindset to take yeah. that time and, and, and remind that, you know, the hope is that these people are, are coming from a good place and let me ask more questions to kind of understand. Right. Uh, and no, I think, I again, it goes back to that vulnerability. I mean, it just puts so many adults in a vulnerable position. And that's a hard thing to do is let your guard down mm -hmm. with people you're not comfortable with. And so um, as caregivers, we're asked to do that very frequently. But also as educators, we're asked to do that because you also don't know us. And so um, being able to really be mindful of who you're working with, um, I think it's just incredibly important for success. Now I've got another question about, you know, the creative ideas you had in, in terms of partnering peers with uh -huh. students with disabilities. Um, I think, you know, sometimes parents might not have those ideas of like how to creatively solve problems. And sometimes schools don't right. either, right? They're right. not thinking through that. They're thinking, well, we've got to do this. And it's very like focus on a certain task or a certain goal. And yeah. that creative brainstorming gets um, kind of, it's not the focus because you're focused on like solving this problem. And it's almost like you're a single mindset when you have, you know, broached these topics, is it typically based upon your relationship that you developed with an administrator? Do you start with the teacher? Like, what does that communication look like when you're trying to come up with some of these creative things that might involve other students in, you know, in supporting Canon or, or any other families that you work with in your advocacy? Like, what does that conversation look like? A lot of times it looks around, it's it's developed around safety. And this could be, you know, we'll go back to Canon and the, being 15 and the kid in detention. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times if I say, um, you know, Allison, I know you've done a lot of work around trauma and in Tulsa County specifically, we have a lot of families that have come from trauma. A lot of kids being raised in the school systems and educators aren't familiar with how to support that. And so, can we really educate and focus on a goal if a child doesn't feel safe first? Mm -hmm. if, if they don't feel connected first, right? And so making sure that we have that mutual understanding that before we can teach Canon a specific goal, have we connected with him? And, that, and you don't want it to just be his para because his para is gonna get sick. We want it to be everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's, we kind of have this conversation every year of what's the backup to the backup look like, you know, yeah. we have to have, I mean, I go back into sports a lot, but I mean, our bench has to be relatively deep to serve him um, because he's six, three, he has a seizure disorder. He falls a lot. And this is not a, particularly a job that physically an elderly woman could do. And so what does that bench look like on the day his one-on-one -on -one para is out? But yeah, I mean, going back to that, I think it has to do a lot with safety first and making sure that we have a trust and mutual understanding. Um, 
and then it would be another conversation of parent parents shouldn't have to come up with their own strategies to serve a child but they could definitely help be a solution what makes your child feel safe right what what do they enjoy you know i i have that conversation a lot with teachers well have you ever asked mom what he likes no mm. Okay, well, because he doesn't communicate with you, that might be a great place to start. Right. Um, would he sit at the table if Buzz Lightyear was surrounding his plate? I mean, these are these are small things that we can do as educators to just get to know the families better that we're serving. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, just a quote from Jane Goodall what you do makes a difference. You have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Um, for me, as I have said, the things for Canon that I want to happen are revolving now around being in the community and being safe. Um, he is biracial. He does not have Down syndrome and he does not look disabled. He is in a harness full time now because of seizures, but also because of safety. He will wander off. And that is a very, very alarming thing as a stranger in public to have a 6'3 biracial young man come up and hug you. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to have him in the community but he also, a lot of these, you'll see, he, he takes two. Um, if it's me, it takes two most of the time. Um, but I get a lot of phone calls now in this role that I'm in around what school district is the best. I don't necessarily think that that is the appropriate question to ask because a teacher could leave and then the classroom is not good, right? But it is what you make of your experience with the school district that matters. Um, listening to learn and really, really hearing what educators have to say as parents, but also as educators knowing that parents have a lot to offer the team. And then really building and cultivating those relationships and pursuing appropriate goals to the future. I want Canon in the community, but the first thing that has to happen is he needs to be able to articulate his name. And so when we go in the community, we have to work on what is your name? Cannon Cooper. Sometimes he still says Murphy and that's his dog, but we're working on it, you know, but making sure that those goals are appropriate for who Cannon is right now serves everybody. Um, and then lastly, going back to um, coach Daryl Glover, um, he told me, you need to allow room for grace. And with that, it is grace for educators. It is grace for myself. It is grace for Cannon. Cannon is not a typical kid. And he's very innovative. And he does things like race a lawnmower down the street with his friends on bicycles because he can't pedal a bike. And he will make anything a bat and a ball because he loves sports. He may watch up TV upside down and kiss animals on the mouth. And I love him for all of those things. But knowing, you know, when I go into the school now, I constantly am telling a funny story. Or if I go to pick up because of a seizure, I try to make that as lighthearted as I can because Cannon is safe. I'm there. His nurse is there. The teacher is there. He's safe. And we want to keep everybody there calm. And so lightening that a little bit is how I kind of survive this world with Cannon. And also to let the teachers know, I'm not asking for you to be superhuman. He's a wild maniac. You know, we want you to know who he fully is. And so making sure that as a parent, you're really sharing who your child is. Um, I will say lastly, like with educators, a lot of times we hear he doesn't do that at home. And it's, it, it may be that we're just not in a space where we feel safe enough to share that with you. Um, but yeah, that, that would be my last piece of advice is allowing room for grace and for humor. I love that, Andy. It, it, listening to you um, say all of this, you know, it's, it's really insightful um, and you're, you have a great perspective because you've worked with schools as well. So you kind of have seen that other side. Um, was there any like a big thing for you you know, through this whole journey, right? Cause you're at a point where, where, you know, like you've learned these lessons, right? Like 
what battles to pick when you go all in, those types of things. Was there anything for you, either like an experience with a school or something that, you know, that helped you? And maybe it's the fact that you've worked with schools. I don't know that um, helped you get to this point where you knew how to fight the fight, what to fight, what to fight, how to form those partnerships. Um, and based upon those experiences, was there anything that any school did to be helpful of that or that hindered that, that kind of growth in the position that you're in, you know? Uh, yeah, I'm so much. I mean, I think as a parent, you have to be willing to learn. Um, learn if your child has autism, learn about autism. If your child has a vision deficit, learn about that deficit. Um, making sure that you have strategies in your pocket to also support, but not only the child, you. Um, we don't wake up one day and say, you know what, I think today is the day I want to have a baby with Lennox Gusto syndrome. It is just incredibly tough to navigate that grief, especially in my position because I lost a child that I thought I was raising forever. And then that quickly shifted into something totally different and um, finding acceptance in the school helped because it's somebody I have to partner with for the rest of his school career. And I'm very fortunate that I've been able to be successful, but checking my mental health, knowing that I can read and learn and do more to support myself. And then also, like I said, finding that village to support you, making sure your bench is deep. If you have to run to the store, that can be a very hard thing for families to do. I love that. And are there, are there things based upon your personal experiences as a parent or, you know, working with other parents in, in your role that you feel like schools have done that um, either really helped the parent get to that point? I mean, because everybody goes through these stages of the grief and the acceptance and all of that uh, in their yeah. own time. Yeah. Um, or something that they've done that you're like, oh gosh, I wish schools knew to avoid this. Or you know what I mean? Like in, in their approach and their work with you or families, um, is there kind of a takeaway piece for, for schools? Um, I would say for your more marginalized population, go the extra reach as an educator to make them feel supported. They don't feel safe having a lot of these conversations. It's a very intimidating thing to be a part of. Um, and, and here, I mean, you know, you're, you're necessary, you're kind of talking about what their child isn't good at at an IEP meeting and where they need a lot of support. And so making sure that those families feel safe. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything to avoid because at the end of the day, we are all just trying to survive special education and what it is right now. And there's not a person in special ed that I know personally that doesn't want to be there. And that I have been very blessed by that. The people in Canaan's life in the school district want that job. Um, and, and that's a very special thing about special ed. You're not going to find a whole lot of people there that don't choose to be in the field. Mm -hmm. That is so helpful. I uh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know. I mean, I asked you lots of questions throughout, so I'm checking here. <laughs> I appreciate you hearing me. Um, I don't see that we have any other questions here and i this was wonderful thank you so much um, of course. i really appreciate it and i hope that um both parents and schools um can really learn from from this perspective and in terms of parents trying to understand what it is that might help them in forming relationships with the schools and schools understanding that again it's that stop operating out of fear and making the, you know, make those good assumptions and form the partnership with the parent because it can only really benefit you. Um, right. So I really appreciate you as always. Um, and I think that we will have this uh, recording posted on the website sometime next week. Is that right, Rob? That's correct. We'll have this up on the, on the website next week. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Andy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining us today.